We have an exciting topic tonight, and a topic that is not uh, covered often enough. That is the role of woman and her virtue in salvation history. So just as an introduction for a few seconds, I just want to kind of big picture items here for a second. Just let's think of, of the women in salvation history. I'm sure just sitting here, you can think of a number of them, right? You think Old Testament. You're thinking Eve, right? I can see Teresa. Was, some, some of you are saying some names right now. So, okay, there's Eve. Okay, good. But there was, okay, wait, there's some problems there. Any others? So, Sarah? Yeah, good. Yeah. Rebecca? And then maybe in the New Testament, you're thinking of the Virgin Mary, you're thinking of Salome, you're thinking of maybe Mary Magdalene. I don't know what you're thinking, but I'm sure you're coming up with some names. There are some incredible saints in salvation history, saints, holy ones of God, of the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. And that's what we're going to be looking at here. Tragically, we don't have time to cover them all, of course, but we can certainly look at the most important ones and some of the most important aspects of their lives. So just think of Eve. I'm just going to list some for you right now. Eve, Sarah, Rebecca, Leah, Rachel, Tamar, Jochebed, Miriam, Deborah, Jile, Ruth, Judith, Esther, Hannah, the mother of the seven Maccabean sons. And that's just scratching the surface. There are a number of incredible women who were there throughout salvation history. Some of them have stories in the Bible that are associated with them. Sometimes we even get, we'll hear their voice. We'll hear some words that they say. Some of them are just a name. But as you look at the story in which they occurred, you know that they were women of faith. And knowing these women, I think the character of woman in the Old Testament, the character of women of faith, we can kind of fill out some of the details of some of these that we may only have a name for. Think of how many saints in salvation history we don't have a lot of information about. You get them in the martyrology, you get them in all every day, there are saints being remembered, and we might have one or two words about them. Oh, a martyr died during the persecution of Diocletian in, uh, in the city of of uh, Ephesus. That's it. That's all you get. Well, I'll bet you there's a lot more to that story, but all we have is these few little historical details. And the same thing with these great women of salvation history. So let's take a look at, obviously we know the story of Eve. I, we don't need to get into the story of Eve and all the details. You guys know that story well enough, but she is really in so many ways, the, the proto story to all of this. Here is this woman who was drawn from the side of Adam, from the flesh of Adam, so that they could again become one flesh, right? That giving of life to each other, as my brother was talking about in the introduction. Eve did some great things, but also had some problems, right? So, and I, I, that's a great, I think, caricature of all of the characters of salvation history. No one is perfect, as you heard in that beautiful prayer my brother just sang. No one is without sin. Right? It's only God alone who is perfect, right? So he is the only one who is not only uh, perfect, but has is, is fulfilled in perfection, right? You might say that someone, Adam and Eve, when they were created, were created perfectly in a certain sense. They were pure, and they were going to grow in perfection for all eternity. But because God does not change, he's immutable. His perfection is already in state. And so, so there is no one who is without some sort of deficiency in some way except God alone. And so when we look at these characters of salvation history, I and again, any of the saints that you know of in, the, in, in stories about the saints, you give me any saint and I'll give you some blemishes, okay? You give me a saint 
and I'll find you some warts and blemishes there. Okay. You get a historic historian who will start digging down and they're going to find you some problems. No one is perfect except God alone. And so when we look at these stories, when we look at these wonderful and beautiful women and their lives of the Old Testament, and then eventually in the New Testament, our next series, we're going to find some blemishes. We're going to dig up some warts. But I hope as you look at those warts and blemishes, you look in the mirror. Because what we find then is a model for ourselves. I'm not perfect, okay? I can tell you my brother's not perfect. Kelsey's pretty close to perfect. But look, we all have our problems. We've all have our skeletons of closet, our background, our blemishes, our warts, our imperfections, our imperfections of character. But the Lord provides the virtue along the way. He always provides the path of love, that path of self-giving, right? And we find in these stories in the Old Testament, and eventually as we'll look in the New Testament, these women who were self-giving, who loved in that true sense of the word. So let's move on beyond Eve for a second, and we're gonna and and we might come back to her later on. Again, the basic story of Eve, we know she's drawn from Adam, Adam and, and Eve, perfect harmony, but some problems arose in the garden with the serpent and all of that. The Christian tradition understands Adam and Eve as saints. You may not know that saints adam and eve didn't they mess everything up look if they weren't saved you and i don't have a chance at least i know i don't have a chance kelsey might have a chance i don't have a chance okay so in fact in the latin tradition i can't remember my brother knows more about this i think it's the this the the first day after nativity of our lord after christmas is an optional commemoration for saints adam and Eve in the Latin tradition. Most of this stuff has been lost. But uh, Saints Adam and Eve. Saints Adam and Eve. So who is Adam? Adam was this man who was to till and keep the garden, right? Make it fruitful and protect it. Who was Eve? Well, she was his partner. She was the one who would be the, who would be providing for him in so many ways, two primarily. She would provide her body through which life would come to the earth, right? She was Chava, Eve, the source of life. This is a Hebrew word meaning life. And, and then she was also to provide her counsel. Any husbands listening in? If you don't ask your wives when some, you got a big deal going on, and even a small deal, those are sometimes you want to make sure you check on, okay? When you've got something going on, it's a you, you, if you haven't figured out yet, I hope you figure out after this series, ask your wife, honey, here's what's going to happen. Here's what I think we should do. Here's the issues going on. What do you think? And she might listen. And, and the, the virtue of woman in all my study of this, I've, I've done a, a number of studies of women in the Bible. And my understanding of this is that the woman has two primary virtues that we find in the Bible. She has the ability, of course, the natural virtue of life, of giving life. She is that loving embrace that eventually gives birth to a child, right? So she is the source of life, this, this embrace of life. But she also has a wisdom. And that wisdom sees all things at the same time, right? The, she's the, the um, she, she can see all the options. Man is the opposite. Man, of course, he's the one who has the incredible strength, physical strength, and also mental strength to focus on one thing and get it done. This is why you give a gun to a man and say, go fight. Okay. He can look into, he can run in that battlefield and forget everything else. He goes for, he just goes in there. He's got his job. And with incredible focus, incredible uh, strength, physical strength, and mental strength and focus. So the man has that physical strength in his body, that natural body strength. But he's also got a mental focus on one thing and get it done. The woman is a perfect complement, as with an E, a perfect complement 
to that. Her body receives the strength of the man. Her body and her mind also is able to look at all the different options. I can imagine Adam and Eve's first conversations in the garden. Honey, I'm thinking about knocking that tree down, or at least, you know, cutting that branch off, because every time I walk under that path, I hit my head on it. It's in our way. Right? He's, it's in my way. And she's, well, that's a great insight, Adam. However, you know, that branch is uh, providing balance for that tree, which is leaning the other way. And if we cut that branch off, the tree's going to fall over. And that's the fig tree. And that's really, I like figs. You know, you like my fig newtons, don't you? Yeah. So maybe we just make the path go around the other side of the tree. Yes, I'll do that tomorrow, right? And he gets it done. Tomorrow, he makes that path go, right? So this is the complement of man and woman working together. And again, any of you who are married, you know how this works, right? You've got to work together for a successful family life. And as we look at these women, I want you to kind of ponder, I'll kind of point these things out, those two aspects of woman. We'll put man aside for a second. But as we look at these, these two aspects of woman, these two virtues, these two strengths of, women, of woman, she, that physical ability she has to receive, right? The embrace of the man, the, and the embrace just in general. Think of the hug of your mother, right? There is nothing as a husband that is more beautiful than the embrace of his wife, more consoling and comforting. There is nothing for a child more comforting than that embrace of the mom, right? Because the, the child came from her and he's returning to her for that embrace. There's nothing like that. And then, the, so that woman has that incredible natural virtue, that strength, that ability to, to be that, that source of life and renewal of life and, and, and giving of life. But, and then also that, that incredible insight of woman to see, she's the multitasker the multitasker, right? Both of these things are virtues and vices, by the way, right? just with man. Man can use his strength to the, for the wrong reasons. He can use his, his, center, his, his, his singular focus for the wrong reasons. And woman can also, in her, her, that, those abilities, that natural ability, can use that for the wrong reasons. And her multitasking can sometimes become chaotic. And this is why man and woman are a perfect complement with an E. Okay, so now <clears throat> let's look at a couple of examples here. Let's look at Sarah, for example. Let's start with Sarah. There's other examples, the wife of Noah, all sorts of other things we could do here along the way. But let's look at Sarah as our first example. Sarah is in the book of Genesis. Okay, so you go back to the book of Genesis. And the first place we find Sarah is back in chapter 11 of Genesis. Chapter 11. First mentioned in chapter 11, this is the genealogy of Shem. And in the genealogy of Shem, we hear about the genealogy of Abraham. And in the midst of the story of Abraham, we, or Abram at this point, we hear the story, story of Sarah or Sarai at this point. So this is in chapter 11, verse 26. Chapter 11, verse 26 of Genesis. Now, uh, let's see. Uh, when Sarah had lived... 20 years, I'm sorry, Sarah. <laughs> when Terah had lived 70 years, he became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Now, these are the descendants of Terah. There's a little bit of information we're going to learn later on that Abram had some other kids. This, these are the three boys you got to know about, but he also had another daughter, and her name was Sarai. Now, these are the descendants of Terah. Terah was the father of Abram, Ahor, and Haran, and Haran was the father of Lot. Haran died before his father Terah in the land of birth in the Ur of the Chaldeans. And Abram and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai. There she is. And the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah. And the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, Iscot. Now, Sarai was barren. She had no child. Dum, 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 dum. So as you're reading Genesis, the author will often insert those little hinge 
lines for you. It finishes off the information, but also leads into what's coming next. Okay. So we're going to, obviously that problem is going to have to be solved in the book of Genesis. And you know, well, how that happens, of course. Okay. So that's Genesis chapter 11, verse, uh, verse 26 through 30. So for a genealogy here, just kind of keep this track. The genealogy of the patriarchs is extremely confusing because it's not a simple family tree, but they're intermarried. There's all sorts of intermarrying going on. Back in those old days, they did a lot of that. Okay, so that's what gets confusing as we read through the book of Genesis. But just so you know that, that Terah is the father of three boys, Abram, Nahor, Haran, and one girl, Sarai. Now, Terah had multiple wives, as many of them did back then. And so we find that Abram is the son of Terah and one of the wives, whereas Sarai is the daughter of Terah and another wife. Okay, So they're half-siblings. Sarai is Abram's half-sister. Okay, so now the next time we see her is... Uh, in chapter 12, but along the way, we got to see a little bit of her virtue here. Look what it says in verse 31. Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, this, his grandson, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, and his, his son, Abram's wife, kind of a funny little genealogy there, and they went forth together from Ur of the Chaldeans to go into the land of, the Cal, of, of, of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. The days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. Now the Lord said to Abram, go forth from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land to which I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great so that that you will be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you, and by you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Genesis 12, 3. If you've had classes with me, you know that's one of the most important verses of the entire Bible. It appears all over the Old Testament. It appears all over the New Testament. Chapter 12, verse 3. Okay, so where's Sarai in all this? Right. Well, Sarai goes along. Right. In fact, there's a little window into this. Hold your hand there and flip over to Hebrews, the New Testament. Hebrews chapter 11. Flip over to Hebrews chapter 11. I, I like this story because it, I, as we look at it through the, the story of Sarai, I think it gives us a little more insight again into her virtue. So this is Hebrews chapter 11 in the New Testament. You go to the New Testament, into the Pauline epistles, Hebrews 11, a whole chapter about faith. It's, it's one of my most favorite chapters of the entire Bible. It's such a beautiful chapter. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place which he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out without GPS. And he went out not knowing where he's going. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promises in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob and heirs with him. And Sarai was there. For he looked forward to the city which had foundations, whose builder and maker is God. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she has past the age, since she considered himself faithful who had the promise. We'll look at that in a second. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead, there were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven and the numerals of grains, the sand, the seashore. These all died by faith, not having received what was promised, but having seen it. And greet it from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth, for people who speak thus. And he goes on. Okay, so the the epistle of Hebrews there talks about the great faith of Abraham, and you get a little reference to Sarah there. Sarah is along for this whole story. She could have bailed out anywhere along the story she, if she wanted to, but she didn't. She was there. So we find Sarah then, this is back in Genesis now, Sarah is along with Abraham and all of these stories. She's going to come up, of course, throughout the book of Genesis, a number of places. But as we look at Abraham journeying, taking off from, from Mesopotamia and heading off to Palestine, Sarah went with him voluntarily. She could have stayed behind. She could have called to her family, her father's house and said, hey, my husband's gone nuts. Some God is talking to him that we don't know, and, uh, and he thinks he's hearing this strange God, 
and he wants to go to Palestine on the other side of the Fertile Crescent, and I would prefer not to go. Well, her father and her brothers and her uncles and all of that would stood up, protected her, removed her from that situation, and sent Abram on his way. But she didn't. She went with him voluntarily. She, was, she had faith in her husband's faith. She trusted that her husband was, under, was hearing God. And in that, she heard that, that same calling and went with him. An incredible, incredible faith there of Sarah. She followed her husband and supported him in his faith so that her faith supported his faith, right? She trusted that he trusted the God of the universe. That's the first point I think is very interesting about Sarah is that incredible trust, that faith extended even through her husband. And then there's a, another issue here, and that is in chapter 12, verses 10 through 20. This is a, a, one of the stranger stories. We're going to see it a number of times in Genesis, but I think it'd be helpful to listen to it in verse 10, chapter 12, verse 10. Now there was a famine in the land, so Abram went down to Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was severe in the land. When he was about to enter the land, he said to Sarai, his wife, I know that you are a woman beautiful to behold. And when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but they will let you live. Say you are my sister, that it may go well with me because of you, and that my life may be spared on your account. When Abram entered Egypt, the Egyptians saw that the woman was very beautiful. And when the princess, the, prin the princes of Pharaoh saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh. And the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. And for her sake, he dealt well with Abram. And he had sheep, oxen, he asses, men served, maids, camels. But the Lord afflicted Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. So Pharaoh called Abram and said, what is this you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Uh, wife? Why did you say she is my sister? So that I took her to, to be my wife. Now then, here is your wife. Take her and be gone. And Pharaoh gave men orders concerning him, and they set him on his way with his wife and all that he had. Okay, so uh, according to the, the patristic tradition and the rabbinic tradition, Pharaoh never approached her in a marital sense. This, If you think of uh, the story of Esther, which we'll talk about next week. Uh, so there's a long preparation when a king takes a wife into the harem. There's a long preparation period before she ever sees the king. So she's brought into Pharaoh's house and she's in the process, right? In the hopper in a certain sense, but never comes to Pharaoh's bed because the Lord intercedes beforehand for her. But let's put ourselves for a second in, in Sarah's place. What an incredible trust she had in her husband, who at this point I would say was, uh, you know, pushing the envelope. He's worried he's going to get killed. Now, we could maybe do an ICC talk sometime on the history or the, the faith of Abraham. It's a beautiful story from chapter 11 all the way to 22, the faith of Abraham, how he develops as this character of faith all the way to the sacrifice of Isaac. There's some, there's clear development in his trust in the Lord. So Abraham's not a perfect guy. He's got warts and blemishes. And here's some of those areas. Why did he go to Egypt? The Lord didn't tell him to go to Egypt. Why'd he go there? Well, he's worried. He wasn't trusting in the Lord at that point. So he went to Egypt. That's an important theme for the Israelites. Don't go to Egypt. Don't go back to Egypt. Go, go to the promised land. So, so the, uh, we see Abram has a little bit of a weakness there. He's worried about security, about food, and there's a famine. So he heads down to the Egypt where there's, you know, it's the Nile Delta. There's lots of stuff down there. But when he gets down there, now he's got a problem. The local Egyptians might see her. She's a beautiful woman. And so, well, I'm just saying I'm your brother. That way they're going to treat me well because they're going to want me to arrange the marriage. Okay. If I'm the husband, they're going to want to kill me. So that's his kind of earthly reasoning. Again, Abram does this all along the way. There's this earthly reasoning that he first starts out with that slowly fades to more of a divine reasoning at the end. Okay, so, but Sarah's on that journey with him as well, and she trusts in him. What an incredible trust she must have had to follow this man from Mesopotamia, to leave her father's house, 
to leave her brothers, her uncles, her fam- whole family, Mesopotamia, to follow this man to some land, as we heard in Hebrews, and they knew they didn't know where they were going. She follows him, and then when they get there, at the end of the journey, in a certain sense, they get all the way down to Egypt, the, the end of the journey, and now this is what they get. And she gets taken into Pharaoh's harem. What incredible trust and faith she must have had in Abram and in Abram's God to endure all of that and trust in him. And then again, in the rabbinic and patristic tradition, she was never defiled by Pharaoh. She entered into the home, into the house, into his harem of probably hundreds of women at that point, but never ended up in Pharaoh's bed. She was saved from that and returned back to Abram. Okay, so now that's uh, that's Sarah, again, a kind of an incredible example of not her faith, but also her obedience to her husband, which is, of course, intertwined here. Now, in Genesis chapter 16, here's a little story that this is one of those stories of Sarah where people kind of, oh, look, Sarah wasn't all that great. And I want to, I want to look at that. It's okay. I want to look at a wart and a blemish here. Chapter 16. Now, Sarai, Abram's wife, bore him no children. She had an Egyptian maid whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, behold, now the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. So go into my maid. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. That is usually, and I, I've taught this cor- a course in the Old Testament a million times and covered this passage, and I always emphasize the fact that Abram and Sarai here have a lack of trust in the Lord, right? I mean, the Lord said he would provide a child. The Lord, and again, in fact, the very next story, God reveals himself as God Almighty, right, to show that he can do this. But as we look at the Abram and Sarai here, kind of weak a little bit in their trust in the Lord, that he would provide a child by natural means. I think we also need to look at Sarai here and say, what an incredible woman. I think all the wives here logged in tonight. Can you imagine being the wife of this man, Abram, who has been promised by this God that your families formerly did not know? that he would have a son through you. Mm. He's going to have a son. Is it supposed to be through me? How is this going to happen? And so with her incredible trust in Abram and his faith in this God, she says, well, maybe there's another option here. Maybe there's something more. There's that multitasker, right? She's a multitasker. Abram's just yeah, you're the wife, but she's multitasking. Maybe there's another option, Abram, that we're not looking at. Maybe it's Hagar, my handmaid, through whom I can conceive in a certain sense. What incredible self-giving love of that woman. Imagine that. You put yourself in place of Sarah at that moment. That's incredible. And so at the same time, well, whilst Abram and Sarai might be lacking a little bit in their understanding of how powerful this God is, that he is God Almighty, at the same time, Sarai here, I think we can find some virtue there in the midst of that, in that she is willing to, to give up of something of her relationship with her husband to allow this Egyptian handmaid to come into the harem in a certain sense so that she can bear a child through her. There's some virtue there. There's certainly some virtue there. Okay, so now the next story we find Sarai in is in chapter 17. God appears to Abram after this. He says, I am God Almighty. Please get that clear, okay? I am all-powerful, okay? Omnipotent, to use the modern theological terminology. I am God omnipotent. I can do anything, And be clear, it is through Sarai that you shall have a son. Okay, so that's, that's, he, he gives them some clarity on this now. So, and this is the relationship of chapter 16 and 17. The the Genesis is an incredibly uh, beautiful uh, narrative, how carefully you hear these stories one after the other, everything's interrelated. So in chapter 17, Verse 15, chapter 17, verse 15. Here's where we hear about Sarah again. Chapter 17, verse 15. And God said to Abraham, 
As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. Now, in Hebrew, <clears throat> the root is very similar here. It's Some of this stuff is lost in Hebrew etymologies and things like that. The, but most, most uh, commentators agree that obviously Sarah, Sarah means queen. So Sarai must mean it's kind of a diminutive of that in a certain sense. So that Sarai could mean something like probably princess. Whereas Sarah means something like queen. So Sarai, a, 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 Sarai, a, a noble woman, Sarah, a much more noble woman in a certain sense. So what we have is a, an emboldening of her role. And you can see that the, understand the author of this ancient Hebrew text in the next line. It says, he says, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her. And moreover, I will give you a son by her and I will bless her. And she shall be a mother of nations, kings of people shall come from her. So there's that, that queenly royal image there. So Sarai probably means something in the ancient period in Hebrew to something like princess or noble woman, whereas Sarah meaning something like, you know, queen or much more powerful noble woman. It's some sort of accentuation of that. All right. So there we have, we hear that it says, he says, then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, shall a child be born to a woman who is 100 years old? Shall Sarah, who is 90, a uh, man who is 90, shall, shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? So Abraham's you know, 100, Sarah's 90, come on. And Abraham said to God, oh, that Ishmael might live in thy sight, right? Ishmael's the, the son of, that, of Hagar. God said, no. But Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you'll call his name Yitzhak. He laughs. Okay, so, so then the next episode is in as far as for our study tonight is in chapter 18. Chapter 18, God appears to Abraham again. In fact, this is probably one of the more well-known stories of Abraham, though because of uh, the Russian iconographic tradition, there's a little confusion. This is not the Holy Trinity appearing to Abraham, okay, in, the, in that sense. Okay, the Trinity is not revealed until when? What moment is the Trinity revealed? Who can tell me? Kelsey, are they able to turn on their mics? Someone give me a, a Teresa, when was the Trinity revealed? Hopefully, I don't get this wrong. The baptism of uh, Jesus. Correct. Fantastic. Kelsey, can you give her an A plus for the course? Thank you. All right. So, uh, so at the baptism of Jesus, right? At your baptism of the Jordan, the worship of the Trinity was revealed as the ancient Byzantine hymn goes. So the, the theophany, the baptism of Jesus, the theophany, the epiphany, the, the re revelation of God. So back in Genesis chapter 18, what we have here actually is God appearing with his two angels. Rublev's icon from the Russian tradition, very late kind of mess this whole thing up it's a very pretty icon Rupla was a master iconographer but didn't really follow the canons very carefully so but god is appearing with his two angels these are the two angels that guard the way to the tree of life these are the two angels that appear on the top of the ark of the covenant these are the two angels that appear in the holy of holies in solomon's temple <clears throat> these are the, his angelic guards so god comes with his angelic guards and in fact in the ancient form of that icon you can actually see that still it's god with his two angels and Abraham and Sarah feeding him. In fact, that ancient icon, that form is called the hospitality of Abraham. Uh, but eventually, Abraham and Sarah get cut out, and then the two angels become second first and third of the Trinity, and et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so, so the God appears with his two angels here. Later on at the end of the story, in chapter 19, those two angels are going to depart and go down to Sodom and Gomorrah in chapter 19, okay, and deal with Sodom and Gomorrah and Lot and all that stuff while Abraham and God continue to talk. We dealt with this in the Old Testament course. Okay, so now in chapter 18, when God appears, Sarah also appears in the story in two different ways. I love this. Look at this. And the Lord appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre, this is chapter 18, verse 1, as he sat at the door of the tent in the heat of the day. He lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, three men stood in front of him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed before them and, and said, My Lord, if I have found favor in thy sight, do not pass 
by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree while I fetch a morsel of bread that you may refresh yourselves. And after that, you may pass on since you have come to your servants. So they said, do as you have said. And look at this. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah and said, let's get to work, right? So Sarah's got to start baking, right? So Sarah, and he said, make ready quickly three measures of fine meal, knead it and make cakes. In the Hebrew, it's all, it's like a staccato. Boom, 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 boom. You can, he's commanding. They're all, it's all uh, imperatives. Make quick knead. Okay. And Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf tender and good and gave it to the servant who hastened to prepare it. Then he took the curds and milk and the calf, which he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. Sarah fed God. That's pretty impressive. And God chose for Sarah to be the one to feed him. That's pretty impressive. She must have been an incredible baker. Okay, that's, the, that's that provision of woman, right? So now look at verse nine. Here we get into a more well-known story here. They said, they said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, she is in the tent. The Lord said, I will surely return to you in the spring and Sarah, your wife shall have a son. And Sarah was listening to the tent door behind him. Now, Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age. It ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of woman, or she's not menstruating. So Sarah laughed to herself and said, after I've grown old and my husband is old, shall I have Eden pleasure? It's not referring specifically to physical pleasure here, but more to joy, really the joy here that have a child. And the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? And it's the appointed time I will return to you in the spring and Sarah shall have a son. And But Sarah denied and said, I did not laugh. For she was afraid. He said, no, you laughed. Okay, so look at that. I love that because here's Sarah. This is Sarah, the wife of Abraham, the patriarch, the father of our faith. She's our, the mother of our faith. If he's the father, she's the mother of the faith, and she's not perfect. She's got warts and blemishes, weakness and kind of questions. I think we can relate here, can't we? And sometimes when we have these stories of saints and they're super polished, it's hard to relate. I like the real story where you find the, the saint struggling in their faith and doing this and doing that, because then it's something we can say, hey, I can strive in that way, you know? Okay, so that is Sarah. Uh, again, there's a lot more we could talk about with Sarah. We'd run out of time. I encourage you strongly to study Sarah, look her name up in a concordance, Sarai, Sarah, and look at all the wonderful stories and place where she appears in salvation history. Okay, now let's move on to another story, and that is Rebecca. Okay, Rebecca, Rebecca, the uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger of the Old Testament. Okay, so let's go look at the story of Rebecca. Rebecca is related to this whole family tree. Remember that Terah had three, three sons, Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Nahor had a son named Bethuel, and Bethuel had, among other kids probably, two children that are important for our story, Laban and Rebekah. Okay, Laban and Rebekah. So when Abraham is old, he wants to find a son, or, I'm sorry, a wife for his son. This is the story is in chapter 24. He sends his servant, probably Eleazar, we don't get his name in the story, but it's probably Eleazar, sent his servant to go find a son, a, a wife for his son. So Eleazar, or the servant, goes in chapter 24, verse 10, this is chapter 24, verse 10, to find a wife for his master's son to the city of Nahor, right? Nahor is the grandfather of Rebekah. So it's a, it's a tent city, okay? So it's a, it's a tent city in that, in that period. There's lots of tents gathered around. There's a spring of water. There's a well. And so then the, the servant says, how am I going to figure it out? All these women, there are probably hundreds of women in that tent city. How am I going to figure out which one the God of my master wants for his son's wife? I don't know. So he asked for a sign. It's like Gideon with the fleece. He says, all right, look, Lord, God of my master, if the woman, the women are going to come out to the well. And I asked them, the, the woman that I asked to give me a drink, if she says to me, not only will I give you a drink, but I'll water your camels too. Now that's a woman. Okay. This is, this is not, don't think of the little rope 
right? Like Jack and Jill. And the, no, no, this is, you got to go down a cave, step, step, step down a cave, take a bucket of water, carry that bucket, about a five gallon bucket, carry it up. And it's a, it's not plastic. It's made out of clay. So it's super heavy. Carry this bucket up the stairs and then take a cup out and give a drink or tilt it so the guy could drink. Now you're going to water camels. I didn't check. I should have done the research before this class, but how much water can a camel drink? Can you imagine? He's got a train of camels that have crossed from Palestine to Mesopotamia. And, and now they're going to, they're thirsty. They're going to drink and drink. So she's going down, bringing it up, going down, bringing it up, going down. This probably took an hour. When he's sitting there watching this, the servant's watching her go down and up, down and up down and up when she's all done watering the camels he says i think i found the woman right so so he puts a ring on her her uh her finger a ring in her nose rings in her ears okay and and then and then he says uh can i ask who is uh who are your parents so this is in chapter 24 verse 22 when the camels were done drinking the man took a gold ring weighing a half shekel two bracelets or arms weighing 10 gold shekels and said tell me whose daughter you are so then later on he says and, and look what rebecca does look at this she says uh he says i she says i am the 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 daughter of bethuel the son of milka whom she bore to nahor she said we have both straw and provender enough and room to lodge in. The man bowed his head and worshiped the Lord. So look at that. She offers to him, that's the woman right there, right? Offers to him a place to stay. Offers to him what she can provide, food and lodging. This is woman. That's the virtue of woman, right? That's mom, right? And so, so then he goes to the house and Bethuel and Laban, her brother, here's the story. So Bethuel, the father, Laban, the brother, here's the story from the servant of what happened. And so it says in verse, this is in verse 50, verse 50, then Laban and Bethuel answered, the thing is from the Lord. Who can speak against it? Obviously, it's the hand of the Lord. So then verse 52, when Abram, Abraham's servant heard their words, he bowed himself to the earth before the Lord, and the servant brought forth jewelry of silver and gold and raiment and men and and gave them to Rebecca, and he also gave them to brothers and, and her mother costly ornaments. And he and his men who were with him ate and drank, and they spent the night there. When they arose in the morning, he said, "Send me back to my master." Her brother and her, her mother said, "Let the maiden remain with us a while, at least ten days. After she, and then she may go." I mean, come on, it's a little sudden, don't you think? And and they said, and they said, we will call the maiden and ask her. And they called Rebecca and said to her, will you go with him? This man, she said, I will go. Incredible faith. Incredible trust in the God of Abraham. And she went and became one of the matriarchs of the patriarchs. Okay, so that's Rebecca. Again, lots more we could look at in Rebecca. I love this, uh, her Later on, she's going to be barren. She goes to she, she, Isaac. It's this in chapter 25, verse 19 and following. She's barren. So what, is, what does Isaac do? He prays. I guarantee she was praying too. And then she bore not only a son, but two sons, right? Incredible gift from God, fertility. Okay. Now, one, uh, let's see here. Okay, I'm time here. Uh, we're gonna have to, we're gonna have a timer. Let's let's end with Miriam. Sorry, Kelsey, I'm always running short of time. Okay, so let's look at Miriam. We'll end with Miriam. Okay, and and uh, in fact, Kelsey's got a beautiful image of the mosaic of Miriam in the tomb uh, crypt of Mary in the Church of the Dormition, the Roman Catholic Church Dormition in Jerusalem, the place where Mary died in Jerusalem. There's a there's a beautiful statue made uh their uh i think they're benedictines or something uh over the place underneath that statue under there under that floor is the original house of mary in jerusalem where she died according to local christian tradition and then so they built a church of the dormition over that spot it's been that church has been there they've been built and rebuilt and rebuilt on top of that ever since the first century and so um so you have an archaeological dig going on underneath this thing this is the current modern church 
of the door mission right over this spot above Mary Lane on her deathbed is the uh, on the ceiling there a beautiful dome of women of salvation history and a number of these we're going to be looking at together the first of those and the one we're going to conclude with tonight is Miriam there's Miriam in that dome okay so let's take a look at the story of Miriam this is in the book of Exodus Exodus chapter one exodus chapter one we hear about how the israelites are in egypt and all the problems they're in the pharaoh is trying to kill the egypt uh, the the israelites now he starts focusing in on the egyptian bo- or the israelite boys in chapter two we come to the story in which Miriam first appears now a man from the house of levi went and took to wife the daughter of levi the woman the woman conceived and bore. So their names, this is Amran and Jochebed. Amran and Jochebed, if you want the information on that, it's Exodus 6.20, Exodus 6.20, and Numbers 26.59, Numbers 26.59 for that genealogical information. So the, the, these Levite, this Levite couple has a son, and when she saw that he was a goodly child, she hid him for three months, and when she could hide him no longer, she took him and put him in a basket made of bulrushes and dubbed it with bitumen pitch so it would float, right? And she put the child in it and placed it among the reeds in the riverbank. She had nothing else. They were, gonna, they were trying to kill all the boys. So this is her only hope, to, hoping that God would save him. The beautiful imagery here, by the way, of, of Noah and the ark. It's the same language, but we'll do that maybe in another study. I think in the Old Testament class we did that. Okay. And look at this. Verse 4, here's Miriam. And his sister stood at a distance to know what would be done to him. Imagine this, his older sister, right? Seeing her mom in distress, putting the little baby into this basket and the mom walking away, knowing what else to do. And then his sister sits there and watches. And then what happens, you know the story, the, eventually the daughter of Pharaoh goes down to bathe in the Nile. And when she sees the basket, she says, what is that? She, her maids bring it to her. She opens it up and she sees the baby. And then this is, I love this, look at verse seven. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and call you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, go. So the girl went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child away and nurse him for me and I'll pay you for it. There's a smart little girl. Okay, so that's Miriam. So the next place where we find Miriam, at least for important for what we're doing for tonight, and a nice conclusion is what we saw there in that mosaic that Kelsey pulled up was with Miriam with the musical instrument, the tambourine, the timbrel. So let's turn over to Exodus chapter 15, and we'll conclude with this. After the people have left Egypt, they crossed the Red Sea. We hear the song of Moses. That's in chapter 15. And then at the end of the song of Moses, so they're standing on the other side of the sea. The Egyptians are drowned in the sea. And the Israelites are beholding the mercy of God upon them, his incredible salvation for them. Now on the other side of the sea, their enemies washed away in the the water. And after Moses stopped singing, we get this in chapter 15, verse 19. Chapter 15 of Exodus, verse 19. For when the horses of Pharaoh with his chariots and his horsemen went into the sea, the Lord brought back the waters of the sea upon them. But the people of Israel walked on dry ground in the midst of the sea. Verse 20, then Miriam, the prophetess, Miriam, the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a timbrel in her hand, and all the women went out after her, so they followed her lead. She's an evangelist. With the timbrels and dancing, and Miriam sang to them, sing to the Lord, sing to Yahweh, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. I want you to notice that's all past tense. We think of the word prophet as someone who foretells the future. That's not the geo-Christian understand of prophet. A prophet is the mouthpiece of God. It gives God's perspective. The prophet, male or female, tells you God's perspective through his word on a particular situation, past, present, or future. And so in this case, this is a great example of a prophetess uh, telling of the past, God's perspective, right? Imagine the Israelites stand on the other side. Maybe the God Apis saved us. Maybe the God Moloch saved us. Maybe it was the God of the Midianites that saved us in, in this land in which we dwell. No, it was Yahweh, the God of Abraham, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob who saved you. 
He triumphed gloriously over them. He crushed them in the sea. Past tense, past tense, past tense. And so here we find her word also. Woman's word is so powerful. Think of the power of the woman's word in the Garden of Eden. Woman has an incredible power in her word as she speaks to man. That's one of her gifts, one of her virtues, but it can also become a vice. In, this, in the case of Eve, it was a vice, right? In the case of Eve, she misused her words. In the case of Miriam here, we have a restoration of that strength of woman, using her word to preach that word of God that was abandoned in the garden so that that word of God could be grasped by the Israelites again as they head off to Mount Sinai. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and the Holy Spirit, both now and ever and to age of ages. Amen. All right. Thank you so much, Father Sebastian, for that first part of our series on the women of the Old Testament. Um, I wasn't sure where you were going with the Arnold Schwarzenegger reference there, but I looked up in the meantime what, <laughs> how many gallons of water a camel might drink. And the answers I got ranged, but anywhere from 15 to 50 in one sitting for one camel. So 50 gallons, eight, eight pounds a gallon, right? Eight pounds per gallon per water. And that's not a plastic bucket from Home Depot. That's a clay pot that probably itself already weighed 20 pounds. Do the math. Yeah. Yeah. I hadn't imagined that in my initial or in many of the readings I've had of that passage. So I'll think differently of that from now on. I had two questions. Uh, I don't know if I have to leave better the second one. But the first one, you mentioned uh, the name of Sarah, Sarai, uh, was changed into Sarah. The name of Abram was changed into Abraham. What is actually the meaning uh, uh, in terms of uh, language, is the meaning of Abraham uh, adding the H to Abram? It well, was added Ham. Uh, so the, a little bit of, a again, an etymology debate among Hebrew scholars. But if you take the name of Abram and you break it down, it looks like it's two parts. One is Av. That's the easy part. Av, A-B. Av means father. Father. So oh. father and Ram up there, exalted one. So Avram meaning, you know, big father or important father or exalted father. And Avraham, Am in Hebrew is people. So exalted father of peoples. That's one of the kind of oh. eto the basic etymology. You get it in chapter 17 that he's going to be the father of many nations. Mm -hmm. So uh, when you come to names in the Bible, there's a, the etymologies that are given are sometimes they're plays off of stories. So like Samuel, that, that's a great example of this where you get kind of a double etymology. So sham to put to put like to set something down on a table like i'm gonna put this cup sham put on table it's put uh so when hannah call, names the kid she named him shamuel put by the lord that is given like in a certain put to her by the lord to give my lord and so she says so i'm gonna give him back to the lord so she goes and right and he becomes adopted by ali so that's the first etymology of that name but then later on, a really important etymology of this name is you end up with a playoff of, of a verb that shares the same root in a certain sense in Hebrew and a, another verb, and that's shema, to hear. And so that so all the stories of Samuel, right? He hears God three times. He hears him. Shamuel, he who hears God. And, and so then then eventually God speaks to him and says, Samuel, do this, do that. And Samuel says, no, I'm not going to do that. It's not a good idea. And God says, do it. No, no, I'm not going to do it. Do it. All right, fine. I'll do it. So there's this whole theme of hearing in the whole story of Samuel as well. And that's, a, I think, a great example of the kind of the, the looseness or the ambiguity of how the Hebrew or the Semitic languages work with these roots. For us in English, we have a very, we have a massive glossary. Right. You, we have 
lots and lots of words borrowed from lots and lots of languages. Our dictionaries are huge. And we have one little, we have a, a word and then we have a little paragraph, another word, a little paragraph. If you open up a Hebrew dictionary, there's a word and the paragraph that goes on for the entire page. Then you have another word and a whole page of explanation because they have very few words. Well, with those very few words, as in all ancient languages, with these very few words, you have a very broad range of use because they still have to express all the things we, we express, right? And so when you come to something like an, et, uh, an etymology of a root of a name, there's all sorts of different kind of rabbit trails you could go with to try and understand it. And then, and the authors of the books will use those too. They'll say, oh, you know, they'll play off that meaning and they'll play off this meaning and different ways you can see it and things like that. So, so in the end, the answer is, I don't know. Father, I have in Exodus 2 written next to the verse where uh, it says his sister stationed herself at a distance. I have written next to there a stance of hope in Jewish tradition. And I just wanted to ask, like, I, I don't know why I have that written there, but I just kind of like there's this, the, the images and the verses that I get are like the women standing at a distance witnessing the cross. Mary standing at the cross with with John and like it, is there something to that like stance of the woman standing to witness? Teresa that's a great question I, I never thought about that way but I think that helps that's really great insight into what we cover tonight and what we cover next week and that is this virtue of woman as we saw in Sarah already that that waiting and hoping and watching, right? I mean, this is what, this is what gives a woman hope in, in saying, I do, right? This is what gives, that's the strength of a woman to say, uh, to, to, to when she becomes pregnant and, and realize, uh, I've got to have hope here for nine months. This is what gives the woman strength when she goes into labor of the hope, knowing or hoping that, in a few hours, or in some cases, a few days, she's going to have a baby hold, she's going to hold a baby and nursing her baby there, right? So, so that's a great insight, Teresa, is that also this, this incredible uh, virtue in woman of hope, of just standing and watching and hoping. And, and think of how many moms, think of how many wives or moms have experienced that virtue in their life. Holy women of the Old Covenant, pray for us. Mm -hmm.